What's dictating what mallards do is the hunting pressure on the landscape. And when you realize just how dense and risky of a landscape it is for mallards and how they really can't make a mistake, it only takes one mistake and it's game over. So if we want to get ducks up and moving, maybe the idea is that stale ducks are coming from the fact that they are too scared and to go anywhere else but their safe zones. So the real main point of the project is to figure out where our ducks in Tennessee are going both in any given day and during the whole entire season. Uh, we're also trying to figure out the role of food and how they basically balance getting food with the risk of being hunted. So concurrent with all of the stuff we're doing with like we're going out, we're putting on transmitters, we're going out and we're sampling all this vegetation to figure out how much food is on the landscape. We're also flying in, in airplanes at the same time, actually tracking the number of hunters on the landscape so we can pair, compare how ducks are moving and behaving with food and hunting pressure. The other thing that's the main focus of the research is the role that these state and federally owned refuges or sanctuary areas, these safe areas have on the landscape. So what we're trying to do is see how ducks relate to it and use areas in and around that areas and see how much they trade between refuges and refuges in private land. Started the project they were like okay go catch 150 ducks and work on these refuges where it's 60,000 ducks are on each one of these refuges and I said okay I can catch 150 of those if I just throw a net over with like just a crab net and uh, you learn really quickly that it's actually hard to catch ducks in the winter because they've been hunted so much they're super weary they they don't like change that every little bit of disturbance and behavior that's out of place they're real skeptical of so like even though there's like you're looking at 60,000 ducks they will avoid your area where you just put like a little trail camera. They'll avoid it by a hundred yards. And so what we wind up doing is we're very discreet about what we do. We go in at night when the ducks are off refuge. We find an area where we know ducks have been. So usually that'll be some kind of scouting beforehand. Uh, maybe it is disturbing a lot of ducks up, but we know where they are. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on those areas where there are a lot of ducks. We're gonna only access the place at night. And we get a, just put a bait pile out. And what happens is once it, one duck finds it, it's just like anything else, right? One, one duck brings in 10 ducks, brings in 100 ducks. So what we'll do is, is we'll scout out a location like this, usually where we see ducks with the drone, and then we'll set up a bait site, uh, give it a few days, let them get on bait. You know, we've got cameras right here and here looking at it. Then we'll come in, we'll place that wire out there, and we'll keep it real open. And then, you know, give it a couple days, let them get used to the wire, and then we'll start closing it in on itself, kind of like a clover. And uh, once that we create that little funnel right there, we'll come in, we'll throw a net on top of it. And this is big enough to where they'll notice it and they'll come out and they'll get used to just coming in and out, eating in here. And then we'll come here at night and we'll take this and we'll close it in on itself. And so when they swim in, they'll squeeze through to get in at that bait, but then it's not big enough for them to notice that they can get out. And so they'll swim around this whole perimeter, just over and over, trying to figure it out. Once we get the trap set up, we're, we're basically in it. Maybe a little bit of a cookie trail outside of it, but for the most part, we just put it right in there and that keeps them right on the spot, you know, so. Yeah, so we just caught these ducks. We got about 15 out of this small swimming trap. Um, we're gonna open our back up, go rebait it for hopefully another catch later this week. Uh, just to try to keep them calm. Yeah, a little bit of darkness helps them. Oh, 
Oh, it's kind of our aging and sex book here that we use to kind of compare our ducks to. Some of them are a little harder to tell the age. Um, so they have almost about every species of duck in here. 255. Uh, it is a hatchier female. Actually, we're going to go um, instead of HY or AHY, uh -huh. we're going to go SY or ASY, second year or after second year. Yeah. So SY. I think people here. start need to understand that, like, you know, tempering expectations based on the reality that these ducks are hunted so much that, like, you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise when we have bad year after bad year after bad year because. The hunting pressure they experience is so insane that like they have to adapt or they die and what their adapt adaptation is is they'll sit here until it's not hunting light and then they'll go out and eat and then they'll come right back we shouldn't be we made it we did it it's not it's not anything else the hunters themselves us made the situation that we have i think it's a it's a 20 gram transmitter unit um it's got a gps in it and then it also sends us these gps locations via satellite uh, basically through text messages and so um, it's got two solar panels up here and it's a raised panel so they can kind of preen their feathers in on the sides of it and then uh, it takes right now we have it programmed to take hourly GPS locations and then every three days it sends us those locations via satellite so we, we get those uploaded it's a tough life as a duck. You're hunted a long time from up in Canada all the way down to Tennessee and you got to adapt rapidly. And so, you know, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that over time hunting is becoming worse, even though duck numbers are really getting better because the amount of pressure that we put on them, you know, eventually it's a survival of the fittest game. The dumb ducks have to get weeded out. Now I'm not talking some kind of big genetic component to it. What I'm just saying is that like experience plays a role and these guys get a refresher on it daily. If you look at when we're flying our planes, you learn really quickly how dangerous it is to be a duck. So we're going on these planes and we're looking down and we're counting the number of blinds. In Tennessee, most hunters hunt out of these permanent blind structures and they have their decoys out and they have their mojos flapping and we use the mojos as an indicator of like if the mojos are on we could see them flapping even a couple hundred feet in the air and if they're flapping we know they're being hunted well at any moment in time about 75 to 90 percent of those blinds are hunted uh, and what that means is that's on a Wednesday or a Sunday it doesn't matter at least we've never had uh, blinds being hunt hunted less than 75 percent of our blinds being hunted those blinds that are very high density uh, on average, our density ranges at uh, different places, uh, anywhere from like one blind for every 40 to one blind for every 100 acres. So still very, very intense hunting pressure. And so you really start to understand why ducks are flying over to refuge the second you disturb them is because they can't stop anywhere else without getting shot. So the whole goal that we were talking about with the rest areas, like we've got our, our major refuge here and then we've got another major refuge here, but there's very little to connect there to there. And these birds, especially like, you know, like a white lake bird that's got all this food, you know, in this just north of the refuge, they don't really have to fly all that far. So if we can get the birds to kind of move up the bottom and, and learn, you know, there are some safety pockets outside of you know, just this main refuge, then, I mean, the whole goal is to stepping stone those birds up and just create the illusion of safety going across the river bottom. So these birds from White Lake and Hopin would be much more willing to trade this, you know, habitat corridor and do what they're doing outside of season, which is spending time in the bottoms like people used to remember them doing. Uh, there's, just, there's just not the safe habitat for them really during hunting season as it is. So that's really what we're trying to promote and create uh, to increase hunting success. Out of all of the flights that we've seen, 95% happen between basically 30 minutes before legal shooting light in the morning and 30 minutes after legal shooting light in the evening. And so that is when ducks are flying. They're crepuscular, they do not fly at night. What they are doing is they're flying directly to where they're going to eat for that night. 
and then they're staying there the whole night and they're waiting to be bumped off by hunters the next morning or whatever they're gonna do and they're just gonna fly back to their safe area. So they get, a, they get into a very easy routine where they're doing two flights a day. The first one is to the food and the second one is waiting for you to bump them off and go back to the safe. and everyone says, oh, look at all the ducks. If only uh, the guys would go in there and kick those ducks up, get them moving. And so we did that. One of the parts of our study was we would go into these refuges and drive through the refuges or walk through the refuges and get every single duck in the refuge up and flying. And we did it for an hour straight, so we got them moving. And then what we would do is we'd monitor their behaviors with our GPS transmitters. And then we'd also look at the number of shots going on in the area. So what we're doing there is we're using um, recording units that are just basically recording ambient sounds 24 seven in our study area. And we can quantify the number of shotgun volleys. And we use those volleys as a surrogate for like how good the hunting is. And what we find is that when we go on and disturb these refuges, what happens instead of ducks getting up there and all of a sudden hunting being great all day, what we hear is the obvious, like we get the ducks up and we hear pa pa pa. Okay, like that happens for the first 10 minutes after we rally them like a couple shots and then it gets real quiet. And if you look, the number of shotgun volleys in any given day that we actually disturbed these refuges went down about 50%. So let me say it a different way. When we disturb refuges, there's about 50% less ducks shot at or there's 50% less shots taken that day. Now, if we look at the behavior, it's perfectly overlays what hunters are experiencing. What, they're, what the ducks are doing is they're flying up and flying around, maybe flying a couple miles here or there, and then they wind up back at the same refuge and now they're scared. And what they do is they settle down and they don't move. It's like if I came into your house as a burglar, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna be scared. And instead of like maybe running over to your neighbors, if I block that off, what you're gonna do is you're gonna run up into your bed and hide and you're gonna stay there. Think about like Home Alone. I've been watching a lot of Christmas movies in the past couple of months. Think about like when Kevin gets scared from the bad guys, he goes and just hides. And that's what these ducks are doing for a couple of days. So the disturbance clearly shows that if we're gonna do something that a duck isn't expecting, they're going to get scared and do less movement, not more movement. It'll make worse hunting, not better hunting. So I think the big finding of our research is, is an understanding of just how much hunting pressure is driving mallard behavior. So when you look at our data, time in, time out, what's dictating what mallards do is the hunting pressure on the landscape. And when you realize just how dense and risky of a landscape it is for mallards and how they really can't make a mistake, it only takes one mistake and it's game over. When you think of it that way, you start to realize, and I as a biologist, I'm like, okay, what's the limiting factor? What can we do to manage this population? You start to realize that like, it's the safe areas that are limiting. There are very few of them and they are far between. And what happens is they're kind of these disconnected islands of safety. So ducks have to stay right in this island of safety so they don't get killed. Well, they're not gonna fly 20 miles to the other island if all the food is within a five mile buffer of them that they could ever want. So they're gonna sit still and stay in their one refuge. So if we wanna get ducks up and moving, you know, maybe the idea is that stale ducks are coming from the fact that they are too scared and to go anywhere else but their safe zones. So maybe we can get them moving by creating more safe zones. If they could actually redistribute themselves across the landscape by having another small safe area here, another small safe area here, then they could jump around. And if they jump around, maybe they don't learn their environment as intimately. Maybe they don't realize that your decoys are your decoys. Maybe they think it's their friends that time. So what we're doing in the second phase of our study is we're taking the state and federally owned refuges and we're working on creating private partnerships of, of rest areas. And what we're doing is we're taking about 100 acre to 500 acre piece of land, relatively small. Most of them are, are right, right around 100 acres. And we're just basically making them disturbance free. No hunting pressure, no people. And these are areas that were devoid of waterfowl beforehand. And all we're doing is we're just leaving them be. There's water on it and that's it. And we're just doing a stepwise process, connecting all of our, re our refuge areas. And what we're seeing is the second you take hunting pressure off of it, it loads up with ducks. And what we're doing is we're redistributing ducks. And by redistributing ducks, we're hopefully making a more hunting, a more successful environment for all the hunters in that area.